Hi, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, can you hear me in the back? A little? Okay. I can, I can project a bit louder. <laughs> so uh, welcome and good afternoon. Uh, since 1999, the history department here at CSUB has sponsored an annual speaker series uh, known as the History Forum. We invite speakers whose work we admire uh, and whose research relates to our class offerings. So these events, and this event in particular, uh, has been generously sponsored by uh, the CSUB Department of History, uh, the Associated Students Incorporated Instructionally Related Activities Program, quite a mouthful, uh, and thank you so much to Kurt Asher and uh, the Walter W. Stern Library for inviting us to use this incredible room. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to everyone who sponsored this event. So that said, I am delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Stephen Allen. He is an assistant professor of history here at CSUB. He received his uh, MA from Temple University, his PhD from Rutgers University. His research has been supported by such prestigious grants as the Fulbright Hayes Doctoral Dissertation Research Abroad Grant. Uh, and his talk today, as you can see from the PowerPoint, uh, his talk today is drawn from his recently published book, A History of Boxing in Mexico, Masculinity, Modernity, uh, and Nationalism. This book was published last year by the University of New Mexico Press. Um, so I am uh, very delighted to welcome Dr. Stephen Allen. Please join me in welcoming him uh, up here. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming out on a Friday afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here and to speak in front of uh, such a prestigious company here. And so uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, my book, which was uh, History of Boxing in Mexico, and it focuses on the themes of masculinity, modernity, and nationalism. And what I'm going to do then is kind of overview of what I'm going to talk about today is first I'll discuss a little bit of the origins of the project, how I got into the topic and whatnot, and then I'm going to discuss my over, overall argument, kind of what I'm, you know, what's the point of my book here. And then I'm going to discuss the specific cases I get into in my book and kind of touch on those a little bit. And then I'll come back to the, talk about some things about re, actually researching the project, kind of things that I was doing when I was in uh, Mexico. And then finally I will end with just my concluding thoughts of my overall, some of the argument, but also the talk in general. Okay. And so basically the origins of this project stem from uh, three main interests of mine. One is my interest in history, my interest in Latin America, and my interest in sports. And so years ago, when I first, the first time I ever left the country was actually in, uh, when I was at the age of 23, I went to Costa Rica. And what I was fascinated when I went there was uh, with the fact that um, I didn't know much about the history. I realized the history there was something that blew me away. I learned things about the United States. I learned things about Costa Rican history. And I was just like, wow, there's more to the world than I understand. And so later I went for an MA program in history and I was gonna do Central American history, Costa Rican history, what I wanted to do. And then my advisor there actually studied Mexico. And I had to read a lot, quite a bit on the Mexican Revolution. And I got very much into the historiography of the Mexican Revolution and Mexican history in general. What also happened was while I was working on my MA, I started to, uh, work for as a seasonal recruiter for the New Jersey Migrant Education Program, which uh, recruits migrant farm workers for and their children for free education programs. And so that was an introduction then to a new, and for New Jersey was a new immigration of Mexicans coming up. Traditionally, they had been uh, Puerto Rican and like West Indian and African American. And so now we had a lot, new number of Mexican uh, immigrants coming up. And most of them were coming from like Oaxaca and Chiapas, but from other re regions as well as like Michoacan, uh, for example. And so what happened is that was another introduction in, into Mexico. And it was a different side of Mexico than necessarily what I was reading about in the books. So over time, I kind of became more interested. My interest started to shift towards Mexico. And eventually I needed to have a thesis topic and I was reading up on some things and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And eventually I got onto, I 
Growing up in a family, my dad's a big boxing fan. I had watched boxing. So I was aware of Mexican fighters growing up. Um, and on the East Coast, we also have a lot of Puerto Rican fighters. Where, in kind of understanding the relationship, there's a strong relationship between nationalism and the sport of boxing. And so over time, I talked to my advisor. I gave him, like I said, I want to do boxing. He said, sounds great. He's like, but what would you use for sources? And I said, I know I can find sources. Because I was like, just kind of growing up, reading newspapers, reading magazines, I can do this project. And so over time, then that eventually turned into, a, I developed that more in my doctoral dissertation. And it's actually what helped me get into my PhD program is I had an idea what I wanted to research. And so I'll discuss later actually researching the project, but that's basically how I started to get into this project of boxing in Mexico. Here. And so <clears throat> what happened then is, so what I'm going to discuss now is my overall argument of this book. Okay. And so the time frame that I look at Mexico here is roughly between the 1940s and it, I go into the 1980s, but this overlaps with a time period in Mexico known as the Mexican economic miracle, which basically from 1940 to 1970, the Mexican economy is booming, averaging between like four and a half and six and a half percent growth every year. And so on one, and we'll talk, that growth doesn't, impact everyone equally, but at the same time, there is an optimism, especially among Mexican elites, that Mexico's economy is growing, and there's kind of these aspirations to maybe reaching up to the level of like European nations, the United States, maybe entering in what we call, quote unquote, the uh, first world, okay? And so there's this optimism going on here. And so what happens then, during this time, the Mexican government's very much looking to project Mexico's image abroad. And they want to have an, like, an, a cosmopolitan version of Mexico, but it's still they have to battle with the fact that things still need to be authentically Mexican. Okay? And what happens is, during this time, uh, there's also, it's coinciding with this economic miracle, is a rise and the kind of boom of boxing in Mexico, where there's many world champion boxers. And, what, and as they win these world championships, boxers become these very potent symbols of Mexican nationalism for, they kind of balance off these two uh, forces of authenticity and cosmopolitanism. On one level, many of them grow up in urban poverty. Uh, most boxers that I looked at, and you'll see this as well in the United States, are either first-generation migrants, or the, you know, they're either the children of migrants, or they are migrants themselves to cities from rural areas. And so they generally come from these like, kind of humble backgrounds that are often seen as like authentically Mexican, right? They grow up, and it's, you cannot deny the fact that they are very Mexican. At the same time, though, boxing is a very cosmopolitan endeavor. You're often fighting abroad, internationally, against fighters from different countries, different ethnicities, right? And so this in itself then, kind of boxers then kind of balance this or kind of a perfect balance between authentic Mexicanidad or Mexicanists and also this kind of cosmopolitan and kind of sim symbolizing the growth of Mexico internationally. And so as a result then the fact that boxers become these very powerful symbols, Mexicans then start to debate different boxers whether or not how they represent the Mexican nation. Do they represent it well? Do they not? And what I start to look at then is their performances in and out of the ring. And so there's some gender theory, you know, discussing that the, the gender theory is very good at discussing performance and how gender is a performance. And if you're thinking that sounds unusual, just sometimes if you think of like a young man, you'll tell him, like, act like a man, right? There's things like that, right? Acting, performance. And so a lot of what gender is, is performing. You have to make sure that you show off your masculine credentials. And so what's fascinating is boxers then perform in the ring. That's a performance. But also their performance is outside the ring. And many boxers, as celebrities, have these like media personas that they have to keep up, you know, in a way that, and that coalesces with mainstream ideas of what it means to be a proper man. And so what you see then is Mexicans use boxers then many times to discuss what it means to be masculine in society, what it means to be Mexican, and also what it means to be modern. And this is where that this is kind of what I look at, is not just is how boxers portray themselves, but also how fans received it, how journalists receive it, and also how politicians will use it for their own uh, performances of masculinity and authenticity as well. Okay, and so then what I'm also interested with this to discuss about boxing, because ultimately boxing does not bring about like a revolution in society or anything like that. But what it does show, it's a window into understanding Mexico during this time. And so I'm using, this is language from Clifford Geertz, who was an anthropologist, about the stories Mexicans tell about themselves. And so what I'm interested in is the stories that Mexicans are telling about Mexico during this time period through boxers, and kind of a way of understanding what people thought about Mexico and, and masculinity during this time.
Well, you have a picture here at the bottom is a picture of Tepito. It's a metro stop for Tepito. And so my, fo my study focuses mostly on Mexico, boxers from Mexico City, because during this time period from like the 1940s to the early 1980s, most world champion boxers come from Mexico City, and most of them end up fighting in Los Angeles for the world championship. But within Mexico City, the most famous neighborhood in producing boxers is Tepito. And you can see Mexico City's subway system has, a sim has, a, has symbols on it. So if you either can't read Spanish or if you're illiterate, you can still find your subway stop based on the symbol. And so for Tepito, the symbol is a boxing glove. Okay? And so I'll talk about Tepito a little bit later, but Tepito is definitely synonymous with boxing in Mexico. Okay. All right. And so now I'll discuss some of the uh, cases that I get into here and who I focus on. And so in my first chapter of the book, I pretty much just focus on the growing, changing demographics of Mexico City and L.A. in terms of their population, and specifically in Los Angeles, it's a Mexican population. But also at the same time, how the sporting cultures are changing over the 20th century. And so boxing in both cities kind of builds up in the first part of the 20th century, specific, specifically in the 1920s and 30s. And what we see by the 1940s and 50s, Mex fighters from Mexico City will be regularly coming into Los Angeles and start becoming very large draws. Okay? And so that's basically my first chapter where I kind of just establish what's going on there. What I focus in is that the next five chapters focus specifically on different boxers. And I use them as kind of windows into understanding specific errors or specific concepts for Mexico. And so the first boxer I talk about actually dates before the time of the Mexican miracle. And there's a guy by the name of Rodolfo Casanova. And so he's the most famous boxer in Mexico in the 1930s. And what he ends up representing is maybe the stereotypical narrative of a boxer who comes from humble origins, rises to the point of success, and then crashes and burns afterwards. And so Casanova then to me is fascinating because even though he boxes in his heydays in the 1930s, the ghost of Casanova kind of lives on for the rest of the 20th century. And he's often a comparison for other boxers uh, out there. If they start to, if they're partying too much, if they're not taking the, their championship seriously, oh no, is this another Casanova? Um, and what happens is, but his story is very fascinating and it captures uh, a lot of attention for, uh, for Mexicans, so much so that actually his, basically his life story is lifted for one of the most famous movies of golden age Mexican cinema called Campeón Sin Corona, which comes out in 1945 and stars a boxer named Roberto Terranova. And basically every other, every, all his opponents are slightly renamed, his manager slightly renamed, okay? And so what happens is you get the, his, basically his life story is told through fiction. And so I actually begin this chapter is the story of him outside the presidential palace on hunger strike uh, in 1948. So this is a few years later. This is years after him, after he was a professional boxer, because he's trying to protest the fact that his story was taken from him and he did not get proper proceeds for it. And so when I look at Casanova then, again, not, is the way people kind of frame Casanova and his story then becomes this fascinating uh, take on this rise and fall. And it actually coalesces with an anthro, uh, anthropologist, uh, Claudio Lomnitz, who talks about 20th century Mexican culture, uh, at least with the governing, uh, the, the, gover the political party that was governing at the time, the PRI, as being very much ensconced in like the, for the Mexico that could have been. And that's kind of what you see with Casanova. It's always kind of these laments of what could have been, the greatness of Casanova, if he just could have, you know, if things just would have turned out differently. And so what happens, though, is, is this story then, we'll see it, it repeats itself many, not necessarily his life story, but people are looking to see if it repeats over and over again. And he's always a comparison for other fighters throughout the 20th century. Another thing that's kind of fascinating and what my book deals with as well is I like to, I'm interested very much in emotions and sports. And so Casanova himself they all, when they talk about him, they always talk about how excited he made fans, the joy that people felt in the ring. There's one journalist who calls him the king of, the emo the king of emotions and the way he could just instill all different types of feelings into people. And so I think that's something else I kind of run throughout here is the importance of understanding emotions and maybe like, maybe from like a very like kind of Western post-enlightenment view of the non-rational side of, you know, life. But as we think about this, especially with sports, it's very important because why do people go to, some of the best parts of going to a sporting event are like the roar of the crowd, right? These different elation, right? This, very much sports is very emotive, okay? And so Casanova then kind of plays into that. The next fighter I talk about is a guy by the name of Raul Raton Macias. And Macias comes from Tepito, the neighborhood I mentioned before. 
And so what's fascinating with Messias, if you look at his life, his, his life trajectory, if you look at how it's covered in the press, is the exact opposite of Casanova's. Messias is the successful transition, okay? And so he comes from a poor neighborhood, and then he d- makes it as he wins a partial world championship. I will not get into the complexities of decentralized boxing regulation right now, but he wins part of a world championship. And then he later on transitions very well into life. He's a successful entrepreneur. He actually has a substitute position in the Mexican uh, government. And he very much represents this, his persona. He's, he's a good Catholic. He goes to mass before he goes to, you know, before his matches. Uh, he's a very respectful young man in public. And what's fascinating, though, he comes from the neighborhood of Tapito. And Tapito has this very negative reputation in Mexico, and specifically Mexico City. And so what I was always fascinated by is I would go to Tapito, because you have to go to Tapito if you study boxing. And then you come back, and you tell people, and they're like, yeah, I went to Tapito. And they're like, you're still alive? Right? And it has this, like, terrible reputation as, and they're like, and, you know, it's kind of like a place of backwardness. And it's anti-modern. It's everything that modern Mexico isn't. And what, to me, what I found fascinating was that Macias then represented everything good about Mexico in the 50s, yet he comes from a neighborhood that represents everything bad. And I found that contradiction interesting. And part of it was interesting too, is when you talk, I was talking to people, I was doing research and we tell them about, you talk about Tapito and you're like, oh yeah, it's a terrible neighborhood, lots of crime, this and that. And you're like, yeah, but there's a lot of boxers. And they go, well, that's because they're very hardworking people and they're very tough. And the, 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 the whole discourse of how you talk about people from Tapito would change when you discuss boxing. And that to me was kind of, that to me was a fascinating thing here. And so what I saw with Macias then was the way then he kind of balances these. And I think the simple narrative would have been, well, like, despite the fact he came from Tapito, he became a success in mainstream society. And what I focus on here is actually the way he negotiates different types of disciplined masculine behaviors. And so in this example, I actually used a book of elements of a book called Children of Sanchez, where one of the children, one of the people in the book describes their childhood in Tapito, and they talk about the fact that they had to learn how to fight and learn how to be tough. And it was a learned behavior in order you know, to survive in the neighborhood. And so what I describe here is how Macias then, he's not just learning a disciplined behavior to become successful in society. He's combining different disciplined behaviors that people learn, different ways of uh, portraying them, you know, different ways to uh, enact uh, masculine self-discipline in order to become successful. What's fascinating with him too is even though he becomes successful and moves on, publicly he always is very supportive of his neighborhood. And so he has this emotional intelligence, I believe, that always he's very he always speaks beautifully of the neighborhood. He always spoke beautifully of the neighborhood. There's an even an example. I listened to a radio call on a, at, the, uh, radio, like at, a, at an archive, and someone calls in on a radio program, and they're like, Raton, do you remember me? We were in second grade together, and talking about this. And his response is, of course I remember you. And so he goes into, the, oh, yes, no problem. And he just waits, like, oh, thank you so much. This is so great. And so he just had this ability to kind of negotiate the different roles, of Me- the different parts of Mexican society, which can be very divisive and polarizing. And so Macias then provides a different uh, take on what it means to be, uh, you know, the, the, boxing, the boxer narrative. Um, and so that's, and so that's my, se- my third chapter. And then so this idea, though, of discipline is very important that the Mexican government wants to in- portray. Mexico is this modern country, all right, and that you need to have this masculine self-discipline to be a modern man. And so what I get to is um, chapter four here deals with a boxer by the name of Vicente Saldivar, who at this time, in the mid-60s, becomes the most successful Mexican boxer uh, to that date. He's a world champion from like 1964 to 67. He retires, then comes back and wins the title again, eventually loses in 1970. But he's very, on a level, he reaches levels of fame and success that bo- Mexican boxers haven't seen before. And so on one level, the Mexican government's very supportive of him, like they were of Macias. He's a good symbol for the children. He's, you know, he's a good uh, role model. And, but what happens to Saudi Bar is he's not nearly as popular as Macias was, despite the fact he's much more successful. And, was, and what's interesting is um, you read fan letters, and I was reading fan letters in boxing magazines, and people who didn't like Saudi Bar will be like, oh, he's, you know, he's like sold out. He's like, you know, he thinks he's better than everyone else. You know, he's like a pseudo intellectual, these types of things. It's very tough, like he's, he's moved beyond us, uh, or in certain ways, like they, they can't identify with him. And what's also fascinating is people who are fans of Saudi Bar write into boxing magazines and complain how Mexicans aren't getting behind him as well. And so you get from his proponents and from the people who do not like him and the people who do like him this idea that he's not popular. And what, the, what I use for this one is um, I was reading, I use a, an anthropologist's work of Eduardo Arquetti. And he has an article where he wrote about Diego Maradona, who is an Argentinian soccer player. And he says that athletes and fans have something, what he calls an emotional contract of joy. And so you have to 
an athlete's a fan have like a, basically it's like a social contract. You're going to enjoy success together. And in the case of Maradona, he discusses Maradona being kicked out of the World Cup in '94 for testing positive for cocaine that had violated this contract. Well, I feel like Messias has this violates this contract as well. I'm not Messias. I'm sorry, Saudi Bar violates this contract as well. And part of the reason that he does he He's not very sentimental. And so, for example, when they ask him, like, do you fight for Mexico? He's like, no, I do not give my money to Mexico. And in the United States, he's in one interview where he just talks to a, there's a Puerto Rican actor who's translating for him. And he says to the actor, do you act for Puerto Rico? And he's like, no. He's like, I don't box for Mexico. And so he's very, like, matter of fact about the business of boxing. And he's very professional. But at the same time, he sort of lacks the charm or just, like, there's a, a, like a softer side of masculinity that is needed. And so the, the kind of, I, I Put this, uh, I'm going to put this, juxtapose this with a series of boxing, uh, vignettes you see in boxing magazines in the 50s and 60s that often promoted uh, boxers' behaviors in the home as being stars of the home. That's one of these titles of these stories. And you'll see pictures of boxers like changing diapers, combing their daughter's hairs, being very affectionate. And so there's also this promotion of masculinity that, like, even, and even boxers are supposed to be affectionate and, you know, they have like charm and things like that. These are other aspects of masculinity that are needed. And so it's kind of like this softer side of patriarchal as we're in a society that's male dominated as you can uh, but also at the same time there's other expectations besides just being either tough or disciplined okay so as things move on we move into the 1960s i'm sorry the late 1960s and so Saudi Bar is kind of an end of a generation. And what happens is things start to change. And so the man in the middle there, actually with the glasses, is a man by the name of George Parnassus. And he's a Greek immigrant who comes to the United States in like the 19 teens. He ends up marrying a woman who had immigrated from Sonora in Mexico. And after, I think he runs some, like he runs a couple of restaurants and eventually he gets involved in promoting boxers in LA. And in the 1930s, he has a lot of success promoting Filipino boxers. But in the 1940s, he's the one who starts bringing boxers up from Mexico City to L.A. And part of the reason for this is with World War II, there's actually a decline in boxers. You can see in, the, the, in one of the letters I was reading in an archive, they're talking about the fact we don't have as many boxers anymore because of the war effort. And so now Mexican boxers are coming up, uh, and Parnassus is the one who's really promoting this. And so this continues on. He plays a big deal in this in the 50s and the 60s. But in the late 1960s, something big happens in 1968 is the opening of the Forum in Los Angeles. And so... 1968 in Mexico is very important for many reasons, including the hosting of the Olympics. There's also the, the occurring massacre of students that happens right before the start of the Olympics. But it actually, something else that happens that affects Mexican sports as well is this opening of the forum where the Lakers would play. But also Parnassus becomes the promoter at the forum, the lead promoter. And so he regularly starts promoting these shows in LA and in, in, in the forum. They're selling out like 18,000 people on a regular basis featuring Mexican boxers. And so he's promoting Mexican boxers from Mexico and, and basically the audiences are mostly going to be Mexican and Mexican-American fans. And so this is a huge change in the business, and it has two major impacts. One is, geographically, it moves the world capital of boxing from L.A. to Los Angeles. Okay? The, L.A. becomes the center of all pugilistic activity in, uh, in the late 1960s and early 1970s. There's also a, a different... Uh, in, there's also a difference in the fact that, for example, Ole Baris is going to be the top draw during his time period. And most of the time, he's going to fight at Bantamweight, which is 118 pounds. Okay? In the traditional U.S. boxing sense, uh, it's usually heavyweights drive. The, so for years, it was like Jack Johnson. Then it's going to be Joe Lewis, Muhammad Ali. And generally speaking, you put heavyweights at the top of the card, and then you put the smaller weights underneath to kind of fill it out. And what happens here is they start selling out more than heavyweights do with much smaller weights, like 118 pounds, featherweights 126 pounds. And this also changes how boxing is marketed as well in the, in the United States, but also globally. Okay, and so again, we see this impact here. And Ole Bodies then represents this. And Ole Bodies himself, what's fascinating is LA, of the top 10 drawing cards between like 68 and like 1980, he's on six of, he headlines six of them. And there's only one card that outdraws an Olibadi's card, and that's the only time Muhammad Ali fell, uh, fought in Los Angeles against Ken Norton. So the only person who could outdraw uh, Ruben Olibadi's in L.A. in the 60s and 70s was Muhammad Ali. Okay, just to give you an idea of his stature. 
Also, he was the highest paid athlete in the world in 1970. Pele was two, Wilt Chamberlain was three. Okay, and so it's actually because of three fights he has with this man right here on the left, Chucho Castillo. And the three of them fight at the forum. There's a series, Olivares wins the first and the third, Castillo wins the second. And so Ole Barri said is, he's entertaining to watch in the ring, but also his personality is also different. We're in the 19th, late 1960s now. Ole Barri is very like Ali, or also like, like Joe Namath, if you remember the quarterback for the Jets, he used to wear fur coats on the sidelines. Uh, Ole Barri is a very brash persona, very open, but also kind of a jokester, and a very different personality that we've seen from previous generations. And so what was useful in understanding him, there's a historian, Randy Roberts, who wrote about Ali, and he said part of the difference between Ali and like a boxer from the 50s like Rocky Marciano is that Ali grew up with television and that generation had grown up with TV knowing how they might be perceived on television and they maybe had actually practiced how would they control their personas, how would they act and so Ole Barres is definitely a part of a generation then where they're much more open about themselves they're not nearly as, like things were masculine, masculinity is discussed in very like binary terms beforehand. You were either disciplined like Macias or you were an undisciplined like Casanova. And now you get this change during this time period where Ole Baris is a world champion, very successful, also very much celebrates counterculture, open about his marijuana use and his partying. Um, but you also get other boxers during this time. You read in boxing magazines. Some of them talk about how they've gotten into yoga. Others talk about women's rights and women's role in society. Others talk about like, you know, like their ideals of friendship. It just kind of expands in a lot of ways what it could be, you know, like the acceptable bounds of being masculine during this time period. And what I found was useful for this as I was going through this time period, there's a Dutch sociologist Cass Wouters, who also talks about an emotional like, opening that takes place, uh, uh, and, and an informalization of manners that takes place in the 1960s. That the idea is society is becoming more informal, and that there's kind of this emotional like revolution kind of taking place where people are much more open about who they are. And so as a result, then Ole Barisen is a very charismatic figure, uh, much different than Saudi Bar. And that said, though, people still he's still controversial. Okay, and be, partly it's because a lot of people don't think he's a good example for the youth. And so you'll see when he loses, there are Mexicans who are very happy when he loses. Like, finally, that's a good example for the youth. You can't go out and party and then expect to win a world championship. And then he does things like, he, again, he was world champion four times. So he has these comebacks. And then he comes back. And they're like, okay, what's the lesson now? You know, like, and there's these issues. And uh, like, what do we teach our children with Olivares? And so, only watch it. and so for me, it's, it's an interesting time then through him to understand these changes that are happening in society in uh, Mexican masculinity. Okay. And then finally here, the final chapter here is a boxer by the name of Jose Napolis. His nickname was Monte Kianopolis because he was, his, his boxing style was as smooth as butter. And so... Monte Kia, though, is, uh, or Anopolis came to Mexico as an immigrant from Cuba uh, following the Cuban Revolution. And so what happens is Fidel Castro uh, banned professional boxing in 1961. And so the Cuban boxers, and Cuba was a country like Mexico with a proud tradition of boxers, that they have a choice. You can either stay around and train boxers for the, you know, and help the revolution or you know, like for in amateur sports, or you can leave. And so there are, there are many boxers leave. Most go to Miami, but the second most popular destination for Cuban boxers is Mexico City. Okay, and there's another world champion, Utaminio Ramos, wins a title in the 60s, and eventually loses his title to Vicente Salibar. But Naples becomes comes in 1963, and then eventually becomes world champion in 1969. So he come, he's a part of this wave with Olivares in the 1960s and 70s in L.A. And he wins his title in Los Angeles. And what's fascinating with him then is when we talk about Mexican, you know, like Mexicanidad or being Mexican as a performance, Napoles is an interesting person to study because he kind of has to, because he's not born in Mexico, he has to prove his Mexicanness. And what's fascinating is you'll see he'll come to the ring many times dressed, and he has a charro sombrero, okay? He comes in dressed like, with, you know, like, a, like a mariachi. And even in, in interviews, he will discuss how he's like more Mexican than the nopales, right? Than the cactus. He'll talk about my children are Mexican. And he'll talk about how I do pray to the Virgin of Caridad de Cobre, which is the Cuban version, but I also pray to the Virgin of Guadalupe as well. And so he's showing himself as being a good Catholic, but also a good Mexican Catholic as well. He'll go to the Basilica of Guadalupe after his before and after his fights, because he's asking the Virgin for her, her protection. Um, he also, like other fighters, and, and this is, he's not particular in this, but a lot of fighters will dedicate their victories to the Mexican president, and he's very much will dedicate the president in 1969. Ole Bodies did as well, which is fascinating, because he's 
represents counterculture, but he definitely, and the Mexican president at this time is very oppressive, and this is like right after the massacre of college students, and they still are dedicating their victories to the president. Nopolis does that. There's even another example where, for a fight where he dedicates his fight to all the orphans of Mexico. And so again, he's very much plays into the sentiment that he's a good Mexican. And what's fascinating is you watch him in the ring and he'll cut, when he comes in the ring in, like in Los Angeles and fight, the, he's fighting in the ring and the crowd's chanting, Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. And he's this naturalized citizen. And what's fascinating is when he wins a world title, Mexicans start to debate, is this a Mexican accomplishment or not, right? Is this a Mexican world championship? And some people will say, I've seen, and then some people will say, no, it's not because fighters are born. And so you're born who you are. You're born, your, your style of fighting is who, how you're born. So you're born, you come from the country you're born in. And other people say, no, actually fighters are created. They're trained and he trained for years here in Mexico. Therefore he's Mexican. And then you'll see others who will say, well, actually, if you feel Mexican, then you are Mexican. And so these, these different interpretations of what it means to be, able, to be Mexican. And other people say then, well, if not place is considered Mexican, can we consider Mexican-Americans Mexican, right? And so there's this issue then of coming back, what it means to be Mexican. Is it citizenship? Is it birth? Is it, uh, you know, is it uh, genetics, right? And so also what not place hits on as well is the fact that he's Afro-Cuban, that he's black Cuban. And Mexico itself has had issues incorporating Africanness and blackness into its national imagery. And so if you know, at the time of independence, Mexico is about 10%, 10% of the population is Afro-Mexican, okay, people of African descent. That was never on any Mexican census until the last Mexican census where you could actually click off like black on the census. And over a million people chose that option. And so there is an Afro-Mexican population, but in the 20th century, with the emphasis on mestizaje between European and indigenous, it leaves out the black part of Mexican culture. And so it's fascinating is not place never is really incorporated with any sense of like Afro-Mexicanidad or any like afro mexicanness or like the black Mexican population. But you do see, and you do see this mixed, like, I would say it's contradictory takes on him when he doesn't succeed. You will see some people resort to racism in the media and in fan letters I saw when he doesn't succeed. Other people though see it like, well, he fought hard like a good Mexican. And so there's other this time where he's also, he can be accepted and not accepted. And so there is, there's not that there's no, you know, like, there's some acceptance, but there's also some racism as well with Napoles. And so he's fascinating then, because you see him with the belt here, he's got Mexico on the belt, if you can see that on there, that's his world championship. And so Napoles is from like, he's a world champion, he's one of the greatest welterweights to have boxed, and, but he elicits these different responses then from people. There's even a, an example where he fights a boxer, uh, Armando Muniz, who was born in Chihuahua, but raised in the United States. And he, and he is a naturalized U.S. citizen. They fight in, the, they fight in uh, Acapulco. And Napoles wins it. This is the end of his career. And Napoles wins a disputed decision. He probably shouldn't have won. And in the Mexican press, like, it was a nationalist decision. We went with our countrymen, right? And, so, and then later on, Muniz in interviews will be like, well, I'm the real Mexican. He's not the real Mexican. And so there's this whole issue of who is Mexican and who's not. One article actually refers to them as both being fakes, postizos, because they are, you know, one's a Cuban who became Mexican, and the other one's Mexican who became uh, in the United States. And so these issues, then you can see in New Mexico, of what it actually means to be Mexican, and not police kind of brings out these arguments, in this, and you read them in the sports media, but people are kind of figuring out what it is they want for the nation. Okay. And so I'll discuss here then, I'll come to my concluding thoughts in a little bit here, but I wanted to make sure I talked about maybe researching the project a bit and what I was doing. Um, so when I started this project with my dissertation, I had to write a dissertation proposal. And that dissertation proposal, I was fixed on. I'm like, this is going to be archivally driven from the government archives, and I'm also going to have these oral histories, and this is how the project's going to work. And I started doing, I started working around, trying to, you know, getting around for oral histories. And what I found, I was able to get informal interviews with people. And I would go to, for example, I went to this through a connection at the uh, center of uh, Estudios Tepiteños, which is like the center of Tepito Studies, the guy who runs it, uh, actually connected me with a group of boxers, who, a group of retired boxers who meet every, uh, the second Sunday of every month for brunch. And so I was able to talk with them. And what I found was I was able to just talk with people, but it was hard to get the U.S. style oral history with IRB approval to go, you know, like it would not, people were not thrilled about that. And I don't remember last year we had Sandra Mendiola uh, who came in and she had similar issues when she was in Puebla. When you sit people down, you're like, okay, now I got these forms for you here. And by the way, like, right? And also people get suspicious, right? And so it was kind of tricky. And what I found is after a while, I could talk with people in informal interviews, but I couldn't get anything that was like the official oral histories. Uh, I mean, I got a few interviews, uh, but I realized it wasn't as productive as I thought it would be. At the same time, when I started looking for archives, um, 
a, so it was, I went on this, like, I, I ended up consulting, like, seven different archives to find, basically, I was looking at the, like, history of boxing regulation, and one of the things I'm also looking at is the World Boxing Council was created in Mexico, one of the boxing uh, regulating bodies. And so I was trying to find things, and one of the, the archive I really needed would have been the Mexico City archive, but that one was not, uh, they hadn't organized anything for my, like, for my time. Nothing was cataloged or available. And so I had to go look at the National Archives in Mexico. I found a couple things. I had to go to our, the Municipal Archive of Guadalajara. Finally made a trip that was super helpful. I went up to the State Archives in Sacramento. Um, one of the few times in my life where I had, in grad school, I had to get money to travel to the United States because I was living in Mexico at the time. And so... I travel up to Sacramento. I get this, all this different stuff. I put together this chapter of my dissertation. I'm so proud of myself. I, you know, the stories come together. And everyone agreed it was like the most boring chapter of my dissertation, <laughs> like of my whole committee. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to change that. So I haven't, it's that, that part of that chapter is like throughout the book because it was kind of like a lengthy time period anyway. And so I was kind of threw it out because I'm like, that's still going in there because I like, there's hard work. Okay. And people are going to have to read it. Um, <laughs> and so what happens then is, but what I really benefited was in general, and I would say these interviews as well, were real life encounters. And so, and I just mean this as when we're doing research as historians, there's an idea that you like go into the archive and you just do the archival work and then you leave. But actually your projects are shaped by so many people helping you along the way in your personal connections. And you need to talk to people to figure out what's going on. Um, and sometimes you can solve problems, and sometimes you realize, no, that is a problem. All right, I'll work on something else. And I'll give you a number of people along the way who helped me. One was my, uh, Sandra Mendiola, who came last year, was the one who actually helped me write letters for Archives of Mexico. Because the first time I sent her a letter, I wrote it up, and actually a friend of mine who was from the United States, but a native Spanish speaker, helped me write it, and technically it was good Spanish. I gave it to her, and she's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's like not, you know, in Mexican letter writing, is very uh, formal. And so you have to be like, you have to have a certain like, formula of how you write things. And so was, that was something I learned. And so once I did that, I had good letter writing skills in Mex in, for Mexico. I also had a friend of mine who was an anthropologist, and he ended up getting his PhD in anthropology, but he had also been a historian who's a big sports fan, my friend Alberto. Um, Oh, okay, Hernandez Sanchez. And Alberto was one who would, we would talk all the time about my project. He gave me was one example of uh, something. Like, have you ever heard of the, uh, the Hamai Cone syndrome? And so the Hamai Cone syndrome is this uh, Hamai Cone Viegas was a soccer player in 1958 who kind of has his meltdown at, while the Mexican soccer team is preparing for this, uh, the Swedish World Cup. Right? It's a World Cup that's in Sweden, but they're in Spain. And so this idea then is that Mexicans athletes do not do well abroad. Right? And this idea. And yet when I was looking at my own research in boxing, I have like several instances where Mexico athletes doing fantastic abroad, right? And so this idea then, like things like that, you learn from people. That's not something I would have picked up on my own. That's from conversations with people. Another one was the, I mentioned uh, the Centro de Estudios Tepiteños, Alfonso Hernandez, uh, Alfonso Hernandez Hernandez, Wrote me, wrote me a letter for my Fulbright application to help me get money. He also introduced me to people in Tepito. He gave me tours of Tepito and kind of showed me around as well. And so what you, and then he introduced me to other people who helped me along the way as well you know, with my project. If, like, this is who I think you need to help with. And the first time I met him, I was still in the beginning stages of the project. And so I came in, he's like, what's your project about? And so I go on this like five, 10 minute tangent of just nothingness, just like this, this, this masculinity, nationalism, nothing. you know, they're just going off. And he's like, all right, I think I can help you. And so then he went around and somehow he like understood what I was saying. And I didn't know what I was saying at the time, but he could figure it out. And so he was very helpful in that, in, in that regard as well. Um, and so you do that. So these projects then don't just happen out of the blue. People help you along the way. They shape things. They, you know, people can do favors for you to get, you know, like, or tell you tips on how to, what to do when you're in a specific archive and things like that. And so, or at a specific library. Um, that, and also, I'd also like to thank the uh, people at the National Library of Mexico who would, you have to sign up one volume at a time of boxing magazines. And I was just looking through every single boxing magazine they had every single day, every single year. And so finally, one guy, after a while, he would just bring out like, you're supposed to only bring out one at a time for you. It's very strict. And he's like, here's your three. <laughs> Here, just, he's just started giving me three at a time. And so he's made my life much easier. Okay. And so as I come down here towards the end, as we're concluding, okay, a couple of thoughts here. <laughs> and so what changed? So my project ends in the 1980s, okay? And so it's important that you have to, like, have a why, right? Why would you end there? Besides the fact that I've already written six chapters and I'm, you know, ready to, you know, 
you know, whatever. Like, that's enough. And so what happens is in the early 1980s, a few th- important things happen. One is for Mexico at an economic level in 1982, the economy crashes, right? There's a default, and the, the Mexico defaults on its debt. And so these, even though the economy had been struggling in the 70s, there's still a bit of optimism, at least what I'm reading in the, in the media about Mexico, right? It's progress. And by 1982, that dream has ended, and we move into like the lost decade of the 80s. And so that idea then of maybe representing national progress isn't as tight as it used to be. What we also see is that fewer, the, the dominance of Mexico City boxers as far as in terms of uh, Mexican boxers in general starts to d- dissipate in the 70s and really much so in the 80s. And so you have things like in the 70s, you see the rise of boxers from the Yucatan. So there's like guys like Miguel Canto, Guti Espada start winning world championships. And you also see this in the 80s then, you start to see it especially up more up north. And so the most famous boxer then in the 1980s, maybe of all time in Mexico, is Julio Cesar Chavez, who is from uh, Culiacan, Sinaloa, right? And so this move then up north and kind of regional distribution of boxers where they're coming from in the 80s. What's also happening around this time is in the late 70s, early 80s, LA loses its position as the center of boxing. And what happens, it gets replaced by Las Vegas. And so actually what you have is, and you see the same thing, New York loses some of its potency to Atlantic City. And the casinos are actually getting involved in the boxing business and they're giving them comps, they got free hotel rooms, things like that. And so LA then loses its, its status as a boxing uh, haven or a boxing mecca. And what happens, I was reading in the California State Archives, I was reading, there were Senate hearings on boxing in the early 80s. And basically there's a promoter who had worked with George Parnassus. He's like, Basically, he says, like, I can't work with, I can't compete against these casino guys, you know, because they're kind of concerned about the boxing business failing there. Okay. And so that said, what has stayed the same? And so I think there is some continuity, all right? I mean, boxing still, it's not as popular as it used to be in Mexico, but I would say that would be the United States or globally now, right? You have things like mixed martial arts and things like that that are kind of cut into that business. But also, the, it's still tied very much to nationalism, right? And for example, all you need is like Canelo Alvarez, who fights, pretty much only fights on either Cinco de Mayo or Mexican Independence Day, right? They're the only two days he pretty much fights in in Las Vegas for the Mexican uh, audience, okay? And so you still see those, um, that continuity going on there. And still as a symbol of progress and just as a symbol of like, pride. Um, and so and even like Julio Cesar Chavez had been a, it still had closely aligned with the government in the 80s and 90s until the government left, and then he got caught for tax evasion because he'd been protected by the previous government, Carlos Salinas, and then later on they go after him for tax evasion. And so there's that cozy, the boxers still kind of were very much cooperative with the political system. That's still kind of the same. Um, and so there's, there is some continuities. And so what I kind of want to come back to at the end here is the stories and the emotions that I think what I was interested in the most. And so the idea then... <clears throat> the things you read then, especially when you start getting in the 60s and 70s, where people get really excited when boxers win these several world championships. Because basically, in the 50s and 60s, when a boxer would win a world championship, it was a big deal. But by the 60s or 70s, it becomes, well, hey, we only have three world champions right now. What's going on, right? And all of a sudden, like, the, the, the attitude changed. And you see this idea then, like, we Mexicans, there's this one quote where someone's like, we Mexicans know boxing, right? And this is like national progress. It's a thing of national pride. And it's an important thing for our nation, right? And you can't go abroad and lose because that makes Mexico look bad, right? And there's even, I've seen letters where people are complaining about boxers who are going abroad and losing, and that's not good for the country, okay? And so these stories and what they talk about, like, and then what I'm fascinated by during this time is the optimism that you often see in the press and the optimism towards Mexico. And I think that's, a, and it's a time then during this, of the Mexican miracle, even though there was a lot of issues uh, with Mexico going on, internationally, there's a lot of optimism about Mexico. Today, when we read the news and the media, everything's very negative about Mexico, right? And people are, and then when I was living in Mexico, people were surprised, like much like when I go to Tepito and they surprised it came out alive, people were like, yeah, but there was like an attack in Torreón, and you're like, yeah, it's like a couple thousand miles away, right? And like, so these different things happen where like something happens in Mexico and it's just like, it's all bad, right? And so I think it's important that when we get to these moments where we see this optimism about Mexico, and to me, that's an important thing, understanding what's kind of, you know, what people think are going right or what people think that, you know, that what they enjoy. Um, and so I think on that note, I will have a, I can go on for a million other stories, but I'm going to stop there for questions and then we can go from there. So thank you. <laughs> so, so, I'll take questions, yeah. So yes, if there's any questions. Yes, Bob. So, Yeah, so it actually comes in in the late, like, late 1880s or 1890s. And it's actually, initially, it's like 
sponsors from the United States and Europe coming in to entertain Mexican elites. And then the government at the time decides that boxing can be legal, but only among like the upper classes, really. If it's like the lower class, they don't want the lower classes doing it. And so very much it's like too dangerous for them to do. And so it kind of stays that way until the Mexican Revolution, where after the, the, the government, the Porfirio Diaz, who had been the dictator, is overthrown. And so basically the story is, that, there's like this story, I don't know which journalist says this, but people report, repeat this a lot, is that like after the revolution, people put down their guns and picked up their gloves. And so boxing then picks up in the late 19-teens, 1920s. It's like the first, the Mexico City creates its boxing commission in 1923. And then by 1930s, there's like this golden age in Mexico City, the first golden age. And that's where Casanova is like the main draw in the 1930s and that kind of comes in from there but the initially though a lot of the first world mexican world champions also were um african-american fighters and actually a number of the fighters who a number of the trainers who came to mexico in the 1890s 1900s a number of them who taught the boxers that were african-american and so there is someone who there's someone who works on that there's actually is this like kind of international network of internet of african-american fighters who are going to like latin america is to like teach the sport so yes john Great question. So in 1947, the Mexico City Boxing Commission bans female boxing and it's not opened up again until 1998. I can't, and so I looked all over for like beforehand looking for this female participation in boxing. I couldn't find it in like mainstream media accounts, but I also kind of meant like there must have been a need to ban boxing, <laughs> female boxing, right? And so I can't, and there's like, there's like stories here and there of women boxers and then like in Mexico in like the 30s there's like one but I couldn't very like I couldn't verify it but it's definitely but this is definitely done that's a good question part of my argument too is that because women were banned from it and boxing is a very hyper masculine world it kind of overstates the role of men in the construction of the nation right and that said though in my book I do use a lot I Use, there are a lot of female voices in my, I try to find as many as I can to put in because definitely the media is very skewed towards, uh, towards masculine voices. And for example, those, those vignettes about the boxers in the home just mention their wives are usually present, but they're usually silent and nameless. And so it's the fighter who's the star. But you also see women write into boxing magazines. And generally, if they write something kind of positive and innocuous, like kind of like, oh, I really enjoy this fighter, there's no problem. But when women, tend, when women argue something controversially, Oh my goodness, the letters flow in, like the next couple of uh, issues, and things of like, how do women have time to watch boxing when there's so many things to do around the house, right? Like, and so basically, get these very sexist letters come in, and it's when women say, like, I like this boxer, but not this one. And they're like, how could you not like that boxer? Like, and so it's very much, and so there is a code of conduct. If you just say, I enjoy boxing, no one has a problem with it. But once you start to disagree, then at least in that sphere, in the boxing, and in, in that world, there's a uh, there's some problems and one and I think I mentioned this in class was I was reading this one these women had it was a uh, Olivares Castillo match and they I think they were for Castillo or something and people were just telling them how wrong they are wrong wrong and then finally this guy writes in he's like you don't women have a right to watch boxing that's so you know you don't have any place to tell them what to do and the guy you look where he comes from and he's from the state prison of like Sonora like he had been he was in jail but he was like in jail like no no this isn't right I need to do something about this and so you do have yes Stephen. Yes. Oh, yes. I forget. Yes. Mm hmm. That's a good. Yes, I think it's. That's what I think it's because he's like quick. And so, like, like a, and so he's also a band weight like 118 pounds. And so a lot of them have a lot of boxers. There's another one. Ricardo Pajarito Moreno, and it's like birdie, like bird, little bird, right? And that's his name. And so a lot of them have diminutive names, but it's more for like being quick. I mean, that was, yeah, for uh, Macias. That said, the, uh, we mentioned there that I, I forgot to mention with the uh, Quaker Oats ad. It's fascinating to me because it says in the ad, it's, it's the basis of my alimentation, it's the basis of my, my diet. And to me, it was fascinating because I, I don't, I don't think Quaker Oats was that popular in Mexico. So I'm surprised someone from Tepito would eat, be like someone from Mexico City would be eating at that time Quaker Oats. But also he's a boxer and the diet that boxers eat has like no carbs. And so there's like, they weren't even, like they were often when they talk about like, no, I can't eat tortillas, I can't do this. They're generally eating like meat and fruit and vegetables. Basically they're eating like the Atkins diet kind of modified, you know, like a little healthier. But like they're eating that. And so that's also on multiple levels that ad, yes. It's,
Yes. Absolutely, yes. No, you, uh, and so what happens is, so boxing in the U.S., Mexico, and Japan has a golden age, especially in the 50s on TV, and even for a while wrestling, but then Lucha Libre gets banned from television in like 54, or something, like mid-50s, it gets banned from TV. But wrestling and boxing get this boom internationally is because of technology because there's no rotating camera and so there's small rings and so they become very popular sports again because you don't have to you can just put the camera on it and all the action takes place whereas baseball and soccer and football you need swivel cameras and so when a swivel camera comes in the 60s that's when you see like american football takes off and things like that and so boxing has this boom on tv then in the 50s then you also get what happens in the 60s also is satellite television and so the first satellite broadcast uh, in Mexican history for anything is Vicente Salibar's World Championship match against Howard Winstone from uh, London. And so it's at 65 on, on, on satellite. And so this, and then afterwards you get when LA, that big boom in the late 60s, also people can watch those fights live um, from LA. And so there, there's always this kind of controversy too, like should they fight in Mexico or should they fight in Los Angeles? And that's more of a big that's a bigger deal in like the 50s and early 60s. But by the late 60s, people are lamenting like, no, no one fights in Mexico City anymore. They only fight in LA because all the Mexicans can watch it on TV. And so you're right. And then you get into, like you said, the, um, the pay-per-view that hits in later is yet, yeah, because in Mexico, I think they tried it and it did not work, right? And that was one thing that always surprised me with going to Mexico was like all the big fights are just on regular TV like on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
Yes, that's true. No, he did not. No, and, and Montague of all the fighters actually fought. He fought fights in Paris because he fought uh, Carlos Monzon in Paris, and, and that's also. Big. So Montague is the most. In a lot of ways, he represents cosmopolitan Mexican. In a lot of ways, one is being. Cuban immigrant, so he's kind of cosmopolitan that way, but he also fights in uh, Canada, in Toronto, he also fights in London, he fights in Paris, he fights all over the world. He also, and um, what were you, the, the, and you're right, and like in general, like Montequilla is generally like on the whole beloved, right? And then it's just like every so often you would see these, well, you see just these debates of like in magazines, I think sometimes maybe also creating controversy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, well, there's also things too. You see in the magazine. There's one magazine where I saw. Uh, there's this one time where they have a. And again, I think some. This one woman would write into a magazine one, and write these letters, just ripping apart Mexican. Basically, saying anything. And I, sometimes I felt they were planted letters because they knew they would get responses from people and conversations. So I think there's also sometimes creating controversy when there isn't always necessarily controversy. But yeah, and also Ori Chutu. I mean, Ori Chutu was also big in building stadiums and parks, and th like he was also. So that would make sense a lot. Like, he would definitely. Continue that, you know, like work with that tradition of keeping, you know, very, being very conservative, and he was very active in the sports, you know, like he builds like the sports city, Ciudad de Deportes, yes. Yeah, so I think from what, from what I've read and what I've looked at is with, I think, because so obviously, like, in the, I would say in the 60s and 70s, so El Santo obviously is a big uh, symbol, you know, Mexican nationalism and whatnot. But the one thing that happens, I think, with boxing that makes it a little different is that Mexican boxers compete internationally. And so the Lucha Libre is very much happening in Mexico. It's a very important urban Mexican activity. But they're not necessarily, like, like El Santo never wrestled like Hulk Hogan or something. You know what I mean? Like, there isn't that kind of, like, international type of aspect of it. So it has its own, and it was also off a of television for, from 54 to 91. It was all, and it kind of comes with neoliberalism, kind of opening a pre nafta period, right? They open it up, put it back on TV again. And so, um, and so there's some, there, I mean, there's definitely both are, both kind of increase in popularity, but then Lucha Libre kind of has this, because it's less, it takes on its own, like, it has its own boom later on, right? With like Nacho Libre, right? We kind of see it's like, and it becomes this part of Mexican national pride later on. It has a little bit of a different trajectory, I would say, but uh, I mean, there's some, definitely some similarities as far as taking place in a ring, similar kind of maybe mix, mixing working class people, like kind of coming in, but also that it's, th there is some differences and a lot of it has, I think, with the international part of it. And yes, Gonzalo, you want to...
Yes. Well, and, and actually, and so it's interesting too because Mexico has its influence on boxing as well. There's like certain techniques, but also like the it's a race gloves and things like that. Certain that, that's definitely an influence on Mexico Mexican influence on international boxing. But then actually, U.S. wrestling gets an influence from Mexican wrestling in like the '90s and 2000s, where it is and it becomes much more acrobatic in ways. And actually, Mexican wrestling also has an influence on Japanese wrestling, and so they have it and that influences U.S. wrestling as well. So they both like they have like different levels of influence. And I'm gonna go Omar and then Jeff. Yes. What I saw the most is when they describe his boxing style. And so his boxing style is very much, they put, it's in the Cuban school, or is it, and his style was very, it was a different type of style. And he's very much seen as a like very graceful, very slick movie, you know, like, and that, you know, one of them says, like, it's the boxing of angels, of angels box, to kind of, you know, like, this is, like, idea of Napoles. But also they would say, I mean, I've, I've seen articles where, like, he comes from the same schools, like, Kid Cavalan, Kid Chocolate, this kind of thing. But also, and then at the same time, you're like, but, like, him and his Pancho Villa mustache. And is it, like, and so they'd always kind of, play in there is some recognition of the cuban contribution but then and then i see other examples where they're just like he's just a great boxer they kind of downplay what you also see is different in the u.s and you see it in english and spanish press they'll refer to him as a cuban refugee to mexico but in the mexican press they never refer to him as a refugee he's just an immigrant you know, he's just like someone who just came in and so but the u.s very much has this more of like an anti-castro thing you know acts to grind yeah kind of in the cold war and you don't see that i've never saw that in anything with mexico you know, and also, my kid in Naples also co-starred in El Santo was the most famous wrestler. Starred in fifty-three uh, science fiction and horror films, um, as well as and as a wrestler. And my kid in Naples co-starred in him one. It was, it's a El Santo, my kid in Naples, and an anthropo- an archaeologist have to find the, the tomb of La Llorona. And so, <laughs> and so it's got some interesting points to it. Um, anyway, so that's I think it's available on YouTube if you want to watch. Yes, Jeff. To get, and, yes. I think overall, what I've seen, I say with Javier, overall he's accepted. Like I think he's accepted. And, but the Mexican government newspaper, La Nacion, uh, or Nacional, actually says they have an article and like this is a Mexican accomplishment. Like they kind of it's like it's kind of like stated very clearly. Um, and so in general, I think it is. And um, and then, but people even write stories. So they even like I have people write like because all times in magazines people would write letters, but they'd write these corridos, like these. Um, and one of them, like, not place, like, going off to, and then like, they even put, like, for the Mexican country that I love, they kind of take in his own thoughts, like, what he's thinking about Mexico as he's going off to fight. And so there is this kind of co-optation you know, like of him. And there definitely is a top-down. I mean, Montague not place himself was very much, uh, was, took photo ops with politicians, elites. He was very much in that realm. And so I think... Um, so there's there's a bit of maybe there's some top down, but there's also the other the other thing I was asking to say it's not so much top down. There is a bottom up, and the big bottom up is Mexican fans are supporting them, and so the Mexican government is not so much. And in, I would say this with boxing, but through a lot, they're not so much guiding Mexican culture; they're responding to Mexican culture. And so I would say the bottom up is the fans loving him, you know, and he's getting crowd and the crowds chanting Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Politicians are like, all right, let's get on TV with that guy, you know, that's a good that will make us look good, right? And so this is another, you know. I think that was say that, that goes on there, and so, um, and yeah, I'll just stop there. <laughs> yeah. so, any other questions? Yes, Kate. Oh no. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Justin. Uh, okay, so it's a, it's a non-boxer. Mm-hmm. Media 
frenzy of Mexican boxing is, is that something that's perfectly set out uh, as something to influence externally? Oh, the extra, the incorporation. That's interesting. Um, what it, I think more than anything, it's a response to the market. That's basically like you have people like Parnassus and other promoters that find this, they find this kind of new market, right? And that over time, what it is like, you'll see in the magazines that they will like the Mexican Americans. Often in Mexico, Mexican Americans are kind of not really incorporated unless they talk about them in the audience. They were like all the fans who showed up to see them and of course they will be there. But there's kind of this uneasiness, at least in my media accounts I'm reading, of what to do with Mexican Americans in there. And so I would say I don't know if there's any plan, but there is boxers know if they go up to Los Angeles they will make a lot of, they'll make a lot more money going up to Los Angeles. And so that would be the plan but there's no, I don't think from the, I don't think the Mexican government, at least has much like has much of an idea of planning for them. I think it comes much later where the Mexican government I think more today has more is more aware of the Mexican audience and like making it easier to vote for Mexican elections and things like that. I don't, at least, I don't see that in this during time period. Unless, yes, try. I go back to the Quaker Oats again. Yes. So this is an endorsement from a non-Mexican company. Yes. For a Mexican fighter, how does that square with the nationalism associated with the boxing taking these endorsements? Does the government have pushback against that? Do the fans have pushback against that, or is this just? So what I've seen, I, I don't know specifically in this case, but I do know he also did ads for a, a drink called Mexicola, and that was a competition to Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. And in that ad, he basically talks about what percentage of this goes back into like the Mexican economy, and like there's like a very spelled out, very national, economically nationalistic. It's a Mexican company that you're, you know, you are supporting, and they, they're, they're donating like one cent of every can to like an orphan, you know, like, to like children to help Mexican children. And so he very much so the Quaker Oats, I think, is more of like. I think he was a very savvy self-promoter. And so I think his, he's, it looks to me, I mean, they're, they're around the same time period where you're, like, these ads are coming out. And the, like, the Mexicola one is clearly one where he's like, a, so he's like establishing his national credentials to make sure that you, know, you can't question him. While at the same time, he has the Quaker Oats going on there. And so that would be, you know, from there. And, and yeah, that, that would be there. So, yes, Chris. So I, I think we should bring up question. Yes. Mm-hmm. And one of the sites that would seem to be kind of, you know, methodologically fraud is how you're reading these periodicals that you're looking at. That you alluded a couple times to there before this in your source base. Mm-hmm. You referenced to the letters, which some of them you suspect were edited. Mm-hmm. I'm just sort of curious how many layers of those periodicals and the editorial work behind them? How many layers can you possibly pull back and see that that's. Yeah, I think so. What I use for more, I think, is using ideas. Like, if you see, because one thing is when you read a periodical over and over and over again, you start to see how they shift the periodical and how things in certain like facets that like we want to say certain um, columns disappear and certain ones stick around for a while. And so I think what I start to want to start is just putting it within context of like. Well, this clearly, like, okay, this, the letters to the editors clearly is working or somehow, or this, like, this is, and it, what you're looking at is maybe this is what they think, and basically what you're thinking is this is what editors think people will read, right? And so if you stay, see it stick around for a while, then I'm assuming it's fairly successful, or you see it stick around for years, and, like, the letter to the editor stuff, that sticks around for years. And, um, or the idea, too, is, like, the letters come from very dis- various parts of Mexico, and so for me, that's also, they're trying to create, like, a Mexican national community, right, that's also being pushed when you read these magazines that are coming out of Mexico City. And so I think there's more of, and taking them as for what they are, is what the information is there, and that is kind of this, I mean, again, I kind of get back to, like, the performance thing. I realize, you know, when you get to, like, the truth, I don't know if you ever see the truth in the media, and, you know, like, there's always, everything's kind of a performance, and it's tilted. And so I'm kind of skeptical just with everything, but over time, I look for the patterns, and, like, well, these are, this depiction kind of lines up with this one, this lines up with this one, and at least this is what people would be reading and seeing at the time. Um, and then sometimes you do get back and forth with, like, letters or just uh, things like that, or maybe even, like, um, um, back, like, or sometimes you see something maybe archivally, or you talk to someone, and then you get an idea of, like, 
coming in of, well, okay, that may be accurate, this may not be. And one of the ways was actually talking with boxers and meeting them. Uh, some of them I met who I, people I wrote about. And so you just meet their personalities and then you see an interview and you're like how they're depicting them. And like a lot of times they're like, yeah, that's kind of their personality. Like that kind of, uh, that checks out, okay? You know, like Ruben Alevaris is very charismatic if you ever met him. He was, he, but he, if he came in the room right now, we'd all be like shaking hands with him and stuff like that. It would just be, and other fighters who were kind of, Rafael Herrera, I remember, was very withdrawn as a fighter. And he'd talk about him being very quiet and stoic. And I met him, he was very quiet and stoic. And so it was kind of like, oh, that's, you know, so there's things like that also kind of play into, um, you know, how you kind of handle those sources. Yes, Giovanni. What is fascinating, you see that, is with the you could take, because a number of fighters, there are champions that come from like Guadalajara, for example, during this time. And so one is like Jose Becerra, but he fights in Mexico. He still trains out of Mexico City. And actually, you'll see in magazines, sometimes someone will write to the body, like, what, I want to become a boxer. What do I do? And they're like, move to Mexico City. And that's basically like what they tell them to do. But what you see, though, is in the 70s, there's a the rise of the you could take in boxers. People start writing in complaining, like, these guys are frauds, because if you go to the Yucatan, you can't get a decent decision, so they're like, they're home fighters, they're kind of like house fighters, and then, like, they get lucky abroad or whatever, but they're not real champions. And so there is this kind of, you do see some of this rivalry, and people write in sometimes from, like, the Yucatan, you know, like, they say, no, our fighters are good, and, you, like, and so you do see some of that rivalry in there, and so, but what I see during this time, and it would fit in with Mex is, to some degree with, uh, the, is this very kind of Mexico is kind of... Like, it's like one Mexico, and then you see a little bit, I mean, you see with the Yucatan, some difference. But in general, they're trying to portray one holistic Mexican nation um, in a lot of w what we're seeing there through Mexico City. And I would say Mex in Mexico City, I guess this is portraying on Claudia Alumnus as well, basically says, like, it's heyday as the center of Mexican culture. Or is this Monsi Vice? It's from the 30s to the 70s. And then afterwards, Mexican culture starts to, the center of it starts to dissipate. I think Monsi Vice claims LA in the late 90s says LA is more the center of world of Mexican culture but uh but there's these but they more than anything and then Lamas just says it kind of spreads out more but so they would be but that's the kind of portrayal it's they're all Mexican fighters and there's some regionalisms and they will identify people though from even when they're in Me from Mexico City from what region they came from or their families came from and so like Rafael Herrera is often referred to as being Huasteco because his family like he was like born in that region but he moved to Mexico City and so there is this kind of so they do celebrate some of that but and then later on with the Yucatecan boxers there is a little bit of a rivalry. So that's it. Yes. Yes. So indigeneity, I'm sorry, indigeneity sometimes comes out. I mean, um, and you'll see like, like references to Aztec boxing, Aztec, but that's almost referring most, like almost to Mexican. But for example, Casanova, people talk about, and this, you'll see this, is that the fact was like, oh, he's like, like they'll lament the fact that he was like an Indian. Like, oh, he's like, you know, it's like kind of a negative. This is part of the reason why he fell. You know, he couldn't overcome the, you know, the you know, kind of these like racist depictions of what indigenous people supposedly can't do. And so you see some of that in there. Um, what you often see, and I'm trying to think of other, the, but most of the times they're actually referring to them by maybe regional differences, what city, what neighborhood. But they often tend, there is a, there isn't much of an uh, playing up in, in of like indigeneity. Although you have people like Gaspar Indio Ortega, like people have the name and it's like used as a way for like authenticity. But I don't think it's ever really dissected. And it's kind of much with like a lot of mainstream like elite Mexican culture is kind of just in this time. It's, it's like mestizaje, right? And so like unless I ask who conquered whom and things like that, um, it's just all one mestizo nation. And so that's a, that's at least what you see in the coverage. Um, to a degree, every so often, Casanova, you'll see it come up. And every so often, somebody, especially if they're like someone who's more down and out, who like maybe didn't succeed, they might be terms like Indio or indigenous, you know, Indigino might be used to describe them. But at least from what I've seen. I saw a hand up. Yes, Dana. Uh, so you talk about the uh, change of masculine and everywhere time. Yeah. And you have problems with nationalism. Does nationalism influence gender identity or does gender identity influence nationalism? Gender identity influence nationalism. I would say the two influence each other. And so I think at least with masculine identity, let me start with that one first. If you're a good role, because the boxers and the sports, are supposed to be like, there's this idea in sports and actually, and you'll see this throughout many societies, but it's kind of a very conservative idea, but that you're a good role model, right? And so if you play by the rules in society, everyone, you'll succeed, right? And so that's important for the nation and, you, and, and especially 
you know, the poor, and especially, this is generally referenced, as much as we're talking about indigenous, but they often just refer to like the poor, right? Like poor, they need a good role model, right? And so that's important to the nation. Um, also, there's a value to the nation to produce good men. And so there's also that aspect. And the nation needs to be, uh, with Mexico, I think there's, I mean, we talk about this in U.S.-Mexico relations. If you ever see U.S. cartoons from like, especially from like the, uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, often Latin America is a woman, and the United States is Uncle Sam. And so the idea is that the United States is more powerful, it's more masculine. And so there is this thing too of masculinity then where the boxers are representing Mexico abroad, but in a very masculine manner, right? And so it's a very, it's a very potent display of Mexicanidad. And so I think the two actually inform each other to go back and forth in that regard. Yes, Catello. Mm-hmm. And uh, So he has a Mexican citizenship. He did get his Mexican citizenship. It's equal, and so, but he's not, I mean, he seems mostly as like Mexican American. I mean, I think, and so depending on context. And so when De La Hoya, De La Hoya in some ways I think is unpopular because he defeated Chavez twice and he defeated him, like it was at the end of Chavez's career. And so it's seen in a negative, in that sense, he's like, like, you know, he killed the, you know, the, the, the main idol in Mexican boxing history. And so I think from that, he's a bit of a negative depiction, but it also depends on who you be fighting, right? And so one thing to bounce off of this is, I remember years ago reading in a boxing magazine, they talked about great ethnic rivalries, because this is how boxing works. Um, <laughs> they talk about, and so it's like Irish versus Italian, whatever, you know, they have these different ones. And then they took, the new one was Mexican versus Mexican-American, was like the new rivalry. And this was like, this was like in the 90s. And so it was kind of fascinating. I remember reading at the time, like, oh, that's considered a rivalry. Okay, interesting. You know, like, but that's, you know, you're mentioning for it. Like, it's much more, it's very loaded, right? That issue of Mexican American identity versus Mexican identity. Yes? Mm hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I think you're right. And it's, it's another, because often there'll be, boxing's like a way of, like, it's a good way to channel like, like these different frustrations and things like that, right? It's associated with, and a number of boxers, when you see their stories, how they got into boxing, at least what we read, some of them, if they're, it's, like, one side is, I was kind of bad as, I was like restless as a youth, like bad as a youth. And they did bad things, they're not very specific. But other people, when they have specific stories, they're often defending somebody. I had to defend my sister, I had to defend my brother, there was a bully at school I had to take care of, right? And then I decided to go into boxing. And so you see that story, Monte Kianopolis has a similar one as well. And so you have these different stories, and it's like, often this idea of like self defense. And so I think that's an important thing to bring up because oftentimes boxing just gets portrayed as like, barbaric, right? And just like, it's violence. But there's actually also these like, associations with honor and dignity and things like that that are associated with fighting and things like that. So absolutely. Yeah? yeah? Okay. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What's that? Okay, sure. Yes. And th thank you. And th thank you for coming and thank you for the questions. They're fantastic. I appreciate it.